Sutra word law duty. The word must destroys our psyche if we do not understand the real price. Only the awareness of real consequences will allow us to take the right actions, avoiding the destructive self-hypnosis of obligation. What is typically understood as duty, beyond the material obligation to repay borrowed things? Duty is the idea of the common good, which holds various social connections within boundaries. It involves state service, the military, and workplace discipline. Duty is a voluntary moral obligation towards others, a human need for actions that go beyond simply satisfying personal needs. Even love implies a sense of obligation, caring for others, providing material or emotional support. But duty can and should be rewarded. The sense of relief and even joy from fulfilling a duty is incomparable. It's like fulfilling the deepest motivations of one's personality, as if embodying a moral law within us. If fulfilling obligations does not bring a sense of satisfaction or joy, it means that something is wrong with our sense of duty. Perhaps we owed nothing at all, and the duty was merely an illusion. The sense of obligation may arise from ignorance, wrong decisions, or deception. In cases of such doubt, this illusory sense of obligation should be reconsidered and discarded. A false sense of duty can destroy one's personality and destiny. Ernest Hemingway describes the break from a false, imposed sense of duty during World War I in his novel A Farewell to Arms. Anger was washed away by the river along with my sense of duty. Actually, that sense had passed when the carabineer grabbed me by the collar. I wanted to take off the uniform, though I didn't much care about the outward aspects. I tore off the stars, but that was just for convenience. It wasn't a matter of honor. I held no grudge against anyone. I was simply done with it. I wished them all the best. Among them were good, brave, tough, and reasonable people, and they deserved good fortune. But it no longer concerned me, and I wanted to eat and stop thinking. I had a newspaper, but I didn't read it because I didn't want to read about the war. I decided to forget about the war. I made a separate piece. I felt desperately alone. The war was far away. Maybe there wasn't any war. Here, there was no war. I suddenly realized it was over for me. But I didn't feel like it had truly ended. I felt like a schoolboy who had skipped classes and wondered what was happening at school. P952 Duty is an internal, voluntary, deeply personal motivation that should not be imposed by force or externally. This is what Immanuel Kant meant when formulating his concept of the categorical imperative as the supreme moral law. Two things fill the soul with always new and increasing wonder and awe, wrote the famous German philosopher, the more often and persistently we reflect on them the starry sky above me and the moral law within me, p. 953. According to Kant, for a human being, the moral law is an imperative that commands categorically because humans have needs and are influenced by sensual impulses, and therefore can have maxims that contradict the moral law. The imperative represents the relationship of human will to this law as a duty, i.e., an internal rational compulsion towards moral actions. This is the essence of duty, duty is the necessity of an action out of respect for the moral law. P954. Thus, according to the philosopher, it is the moral law, independent of external causes, that truly makes a person free. P955. Famous Austrian psychiatrist, philosopher, and founder of psychoanalysis Sigmund Freud linked the concept of duty to the existence of the superego in the human psyche. It acts as an internal parent that critically evaluates all our actions and oppresses us with moral norms and guilt, p. 956. Thus, duty is perceived by the personality as external violence, 
which can become internal, but its repressive nature remains unchanged. Through socialization, a person learns to derive pleasure from fulfilling duty, but for this, according to Freud, they must sublimate their natural needs, redirecting libido energy toward socially significant goals. In this case, a person avoids neurosis and receives a specifically human, though not animal, but real satisfaction. This can be the aesthetic experience of artistic creation, writing a book, painting a picture, intellectual joy from a scientific discovery, or the thrill of winning a sports competition. In other words, a person needs a real reward for fulfilling duty, not just submission to repressive social authority as the fulfillment of some abstract ought. American economist Mankur Olson develops a similar viewpoint, outlining the logic of collective action organization, P957. Until each member of a collective sees individual benefit in the common cause, they will be more likely to follow their own individual program of actions rather than the collective one. There is no abstract duty to the collective this duty must acquire tangible material benefits. Only then does it become meaningful to the individual who will sincerely identify with the collective and strive toward shared goals that coincide with their personal interests. We all have one anchor, from which, unless we choose otherwise, we will never break free, the sense of duty. Ivan Turgenev Representatives of the Austrian School of Political Economy, starting with Leopold von Mises and ending with Friedrich von Hayek, consistently criticized abstract collectivism. They argued that only market mechanisms, which determine prices and resource distribution, can dictate how individuals should act not only in the economic sphere but in all areas of life. Their methodological individualism and subjectivism are among the classical foundations of modern political liberalism. In philosophy, Radical criticism of the formal understanding of duty was carried out by the German philosopher and founder of philosophical anthropology Max Scheler in his work Formalism in Ethics and Non-Formal Ethics of Values, p. 960, where he pointed out the impossibility of justifying the concept of duty without addressing its content the subject of obligation. The German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche wrote, a man can endure any what if he has a sufficient why, p. 961. If a person hears the word must without an explanation, without understanding why they must do something, what the price of inaction is, and what they will gain from the action, they begin to rebel, get angry, fall into depression, and lose the joy of life. This is why people who bind themselves with illusions of duty live in constant stress. In reality, many duties we take on are completely unnecessary, and we can easily rid ourselves of them if we carefully examine the consequences of not fulfilling them. If it was borrowed long ago, it's as good as forgotten. If you lent it, just wait. Christianity, like any religion, imposes certain significant obligations on believers, yet the greatest reward God's love is already given to believers without any obligations. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, wrote the Apostle Paul, Romans 5 8. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life states the Gospel of John, John 3.16. Thus, even in following Christian commandments, there is already a reward God's love, God is love, and the promised kingdom of heaven. Sincere love for God is an inner need of a person, rather than mere adherence to formal religious rules, is the essence of Christianity. Christ introduced a completely new perspective on the relationship between God and people, freeing his followers from the false sense of duty, I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends, 
for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you, John 15:15. 15, 15. A servant must obey his master's commands without question, but friendship is something entirely different. Since the primary sign of friendship is sharing secrets, just as the Lord reveals the logic of existence and spiritual mysteries, thus freeing man from the slavery of obligation and commands between man and God, therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman, Galatians 4.31. This, in turn, becomes a model for relationships between people. A creative person submits to a higher law than the simple law of duty. For one who is called to perform a great deed, make a discovery, or achieve a feat that advances humanity, the true homeland is not their nation, but their deed. They feel responsible ultimately to only one authority the task they are destined to fulfill, and they are more likely to disregard the state's temporary interests than the inner obligation imposed by their unique destiny and talent. Stefan Zweig Similarly, the New Testament encapsulates the teachings of Christ in the phrase that subtly cautions the use of the word duty, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself, Galatians 5.14. Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another, for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law, writes Apostle Paul, Romans 13, 8. If we must use duty, it should only refer to ourselves, I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish, Romans 1, 14, not that someone owes me, but I am obligated because I recognize the goodness of this duty. However, to avoid misunderstanding the concept of duty, the Apostle clarifies, You were bought at a price, do not become slaves of human beings, 1 Corinthians 7.23. In many families, only one spouse may be a believer, and they may try, sometimes forcefully, to make the other a believer, appealing to the notion of duty. However, Christianity, through the words of the Apostle Paul, foresaw this issue and emphasized the harm of such thoughts, for the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband, 1 Corinthians 7:14. In other words, focus on your spiritual path, and through this, your spouse will naturally be drawn to spirituality. Sincerity and genuineness of feelings in the relationship with God are also fundamental in Islam. The Quran mentions hypocrites 37 times, who only pretend to accept Islam. Among people are those who say, we believe in Allah and the last day, but they do not really believe. They try to deceive Allah and the believers, but they only deceive themselves without realizing it. Quran 2 13 One of the five pillars of Islam is the Shahada the testimony of faith, which reflects the acknowledgement of monotheism, there is no God but Allah, and the prophetic mission of Muhammad, Muhammad is his messenger. A person becomes a Muslim when they consciously and responsibly pronounce the words of the Shahada. By these words, a person agrees to surrender their life to Allah, that is, to become a Muslim, submitting their life to the Almighty. After proclaiming this testimony, the main measure of their life should be the satisfaction of the Creator. Duty not arguing, I'll repay it slowly, but press me and you'll never see it in your lifetime. At the same time, Islam places great importance on rewarding believers for fulfilling their duties to Allah. The Quran offers a very detailed and vivid description of paradise. The Quranic paradise is a shady garden with many springs, canals, and ponds. The righteous dwell in lush dark green gardens, with rivers of untainted water, rivers of milk, the taste of which never changes, rivers of wine, delicious to drink and rivers of purified honey. 
the inhabitants of paradise recline on embroidered couches, on spread out carpets, leaning on couches whose linings are made of brocade. They will wear garments of green silk and brocade, adorned with silver jewelry. They will see neither scorching heat nor bitter cold, for the shade will be close above them. They eat fruits of their choosing and the meat of birds that they desire, and so on. The main pleasures in Islamic paradise are coolness, peace, luxurious clothing, pleasant food and drink, and eternally youthful companions, including both heavenly maidens and one's earthly wives, who will be made virgins again and forever young. According to post-Quranic traditions, all inhabitants of paradise will be 33 years old. These vivid, sensual images of heavenly bliss were especially important for inspiring warriors of jihad, mainly unsophisticated nomads, during the great Arab conquests of the 70th -th centuries, during which Islam spread across vast parts of the Middle East and North Africa, and the enormous new state of the Arab Caliphate was established. Jewish legal scholars developed an original doctrine on the nature of duty. According to them, the need to fulfill one's duty, to pay a debt, has not only a civil legal basis but also a moral ethical one. For a devout Jew, duty always has meaning it is the fulfillment of the ancient covenant between God and man. The famous Israeli legal scholar Moshe Silberg wrote, The concept of obligation, duty in Jewish law is not exhausted or narrowed by the possibility of civil enforcement by the creditor it is significantly based on the religious and ethical obligation of the debtor to repay the debt. Here the ethical foundations of Jewish law are expressed, which leave their mark in various ways on the special character of Jewish teachings about obligations. This is why Jews have historically produced successful bankers, debts did not oppress them, they understood their meaning, and knew how to manage them. Duty commands us to do what is just and right and forbids us from doing what is unjust and wrong. Samuel smiles. Well, buddy, when's the debt due? It's on me. Interestingly, Buddhism interprets the theme of moral duty quite differently. Paradoxically, actions performed out of a sense of duty are not considered genuine by Buddhists. Buddhist ethics focuses on intention, the expression, and development of positive mental states, rather than strictly adhering to established rules. It is not true generosity if we give out of a sense of duty or because we have to. Human daily life is filled with obligations. Our usual schedules dictate what to do, whom to meet, and where to go. Days are planned down to the minute. For some, this active lifestyle and pace bring a multitude of negative emotions. They dart around in stress, with no joy or pleasure in what they do. For others, this way of life brings joy, it sets a certain pace at which they run through life without stopping. What is the difference between these two groups of people? The first group bears an unbearable burden of duty that no one is actually demanding from them. Often, they see debts and obligations everywhere and, unfortunately, do not understand to whom and why they owe anything. Their days are turned into an endless series of tasks they hate fulfilling, causing them to suffer. The second category of people takes their responsibilities lightly, as they can genuinely bring them true joy. If you ask them why they do it, you will hear a very clear answer. These happy performers clearly understand what they are doing this for, what they gain in return, and they approach their obligations in a highly rational way. Of course, we cannot exclude the fact that they may genuinely enjoy their activities, and this pleasure also serves as a form of payment. After all, interest and love can be tremendously powerful drivers. According to psychologist Barbara Fredrickson, Love for one's work and positive emotions can broaden horizons and help build relationships. The debt is old, but who remembers it? Do not rush, dear, this year is different, 
loans have fallen like hail. Consider the example of Michelangelo. The father of the famous artist passionately wanted his son to become a merchant, to trade in silk and support the family. He saw this path as a means of financial and status stability and sincerely believed that his son should obey him and must fulfill his will. However, fortunately for world culture, Michelangelo did not fulfill his duty to his family, despite his father's beatings when he caught him drawing. The concept of duty existed only in the family's understanding, for Michelangelo, it brought him nothing but trouble. Trading was of no interest to the genius, and his father's beatings caused him emotional and physical pain. However, Michelangelo persevered. His love for art allowed him to overcome all obstacles. The imposed duty was not a duty for him at all. If his father had managed to change his son's path, it would have been a significant loss for world culture. Moreover, for Michelangelo, it would likely have become an eternal source of dislike and suffering. Throughout his creative life, Michelangelo produced many brilliant works. He had plenty of work to do, and duty was also present. He was bound by obligations to his patrons, but in this case, his boundless love for his craft and understanding of why he was doing it gave him incredible productivity. Write the debt on the wall, if it doesn't show up, write it on the door, and receive it from the top. Whoever I owe I forgive everyone. According to experts, a conscious approach to duty, which involves understanding why we are doing something and analyzing the consequences of not fulfilling it, will help us be more selective about our debts. Re-evaluating the obligations we take on will help us preserve our physical and emotional energy. It is essential to remember that a duty becomes ours only if we agree to it ourselves. We need to set priorities correctly and refuse the things that are unimportant to us. The main questions are, why, and what will happen if I don't do this? Answering them will help us understand the real cost of our debts.